on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. Our fears and our tragedies are opportunities. We don't learn as much from these groundbreaking moments as we do from the moments that nearly threaten our lives or they shake up our value system and we have an opportunity to get stronger there. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello, AS, and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show. It's James Blatch. And Mark Dawson. Uh, hello to you, Mark Dawson. We're recording this quite late in the week for us, aren't we? So this is bang up to date. What can we say that's bang up to date? Um, we could say it's my daughter's birthday today. That's um, I'm recording on my daughter's birthday, which wow. is uh, I'm very, very busy today. So running into the office to do this, then running back home to do stuff. And oh my goodness, it's very busy at the moment. It's wow. in London last night, back home late. Loads going on. Okay, well, we're going to talk about London last night. We should say happy birthday to Freya. That's an exciting day. How, how is she? Six? Is that right? Eight. Eight. Oh, my goodness. Doesn't mm. time fly? <laughs> it does. Okay. Well, I've just celebrated the 16th of mine, so it gets even mm, more goodness. terrifying as you get older. Right. Yes. We're going to talk Thank about you. quite a lot today. Uh, let's start by welcoming our Patreon supporters who have gone to patreon.com forward slash the self-publishing show. Uh, and they've pledged uh, a minimum of a dollar an episode could be up to three dollars and there's a scaling slide of what you get in return for that but we're very welcome sliding uh, scale sliding scale indeed yes that's quite right um but we are uh, very pleased uh, for people to join us and we'd like to welcome them we're going to welcome Jeanette now this is actually quite a difficult one in fact you know what I'm going to hand it over to you to pronounce I'll spell it to you Mark are you ready oh yes h-r-v-a-t-i-n H R V I T I N. No, H R V A T I N. Mm, I'm, I'm too polite to try because yeah. I almost certainly get that wrong. So um, we'll, we'll just so thank you well, to Jeanette. Yeah. Nothing benched, nothing gained. Luckily, I've got her um, author name, which is J M Hart. And I, ah, we do you know do what, that. Jeanette? I think that was a good decision to go with uh, J M Hart as an author name there. Uh, she's from Sydney, Australia. So thank you very much indeed, Jeanette. Uh, and Sandra Matthews is also joining us this week. So Sandra. You are very welcome. Uh, you can go to patreon.com forward slash the self-publishing show. And the best thing you get from it, I think you get lots of things actually at the various levels, but one of the best things perhaps you get is you get entry to the SPF University and we have regular live training just for you on that. Right, worth every penny, worth every cent. <laughs> Okay, we're going to talk a couple of things before we hear from today's interviewee. And Mark, last night you were in London. You've been a judge on the, what the, the Premier Book Prize. In the case, I did notice it seemed to be the same day as the Booker was announced. It that, was, that's obviously it was, deliberate, is it? I don't know. It probably was actually, but yes, it was um, Mariella Frostrup, who is um, quite well known in the UK. Not well known, I don't think, outside the UK. But she was the uh, kind of the celebrity judge this year. And she, uh, she did make reference to the fact that there was another um, less prestigious award going on somewhere down the road from where we were on, in St. Martin's Lane in London. Um, but it, it was good. Yeah, I, I was. this is the first time I've been a judge. Um, so there was me, um, LJ Ross, Orna Ross, who is a Ross contingent on yeah. the panel this year, um, a couple of Amazonians. Um, and we had lunch um, about two months ago and we, we, we talked about the, the five books that had been nominated and very pleasing to see at least three of them are by um, SPF community members, which is, is lovely, um, including the winner. Um, and we, yeah, we had a, it was a difficult judging decision. I won't say anything more about that because I think that kind of stuff has to stay confidential. But we, we, we've had a very interesting discussion and eventually came to choose the, the winner. He was a man called Ian Sainsbury, and I'll say something about him in a minute. But um, when we were in um, Nink in Florida um, at the Shark Tooth Tavern for our Wednesday drinks, one of the nominees came up to me, and um, in, I don't know whether he knew I was a judge or not, but his name is, I'm going to get this wrong, it's its an Irish name, but it's, it's Queeve, I think, something along those lines. Um, he wrote a really good book that I enjoyed very much, but um, I had to do my best poker face because we weren't allowed to say 
obviously oh. who the winner was. Yes. And I was I was kind of slightly taken aback and a little I had a little bit to drink, but I'm just about managed right. I think I did manage to pull it off. He didn't know um uh that I obviously I knew who the winner was. So Anyway, yes, we went to um, London yesterday and had the uh, the awards, and um, it was really lovely because um, Ian is, I think, he's about fifty. I think uh, he's been writing for a while, mostly sci-fi, and he wrote um, a psychological thriller called "The Picture on the Fridge" or "Pictures on the Fridge," which is a really interesting concept um, where a small child starts kind of drawing. Um, what turned out to be murder scenes in America. So there's no real, she, she shouldn't be able to know what these scenes look like and she's drawing accurate representations of them. So it's an interesting concept um, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And because I knew who the winner was, I, I was watching him very carefully as the announcement was made and it was um, it was lovely. He looked kind of staggered. Um, because this is a twenty thousand pound prize, so it's yes. not it's good, it's good money. Um, he gets an APUB contract, and his book will now possibly be um, taken forwards to for a prime video production as well. There's a chance that might come off. But apart from his reaction, the even lovely reaction was his wife, um, who was standing next to him and burst into tears. Um, oh. And I think not. As, I didn't speak to her. I did speak. I spoke to him quite a lot, but I think um, from it looked to me like it wasn't necessarily the fact that he'd won twenty thousand pounds. It was more that he'd been acknowledged after uh, trying hard for a long time and doing quite well. I mean, sci-fi did pretty well, I think, but um, he was acknowledged very publicly as as a very good writer. Um, so that was very very sweet. Um, and then subsequently to that, I found out he lives in Beckles, which is about five miles away from Lowestoft, where I'm from. Um, he met his wife. Uh, in Lowestoft, which is where I'm from. Um, so lots in common. Mm. Um, so it was great. And coming to the uh, live show next year, in fact, several of the, um, maybe even all of the nominees are coming to the live show next year. So that yeah. was that was great as well. So well, we it was should... all all in a, a very, very enjoyable evening. Yeah, we should, we should mention. So Hannah Ellis uh, was one of the nominees. And I'm also not 100% on the pronunciation of Mr. McDonald's first name. But uh, what do you think it was? It's, I think it's very, st- I think it's Queeve. Reeve McDonnell, uh, Claire Moore, uh, Emily Organ, and Ian Sainsbury. I mean, Emily's been around in our community for a long time, um, mm. and I re- do recognise all the names. So, uh, one way or another, even if they're not SPFers, they're very much part of the indie community and scene. So, it's a great. This is our our award, and and I say our our is now such a, a huge movement uh, globally that this this award's only going to get stronger and stronger. And twenty grand is not to be sniffed at, right? No, absolutely not. No, it's uh, it's, a, it's a big chunk of change. So, I mean, that was that was lovely, but it was it was more. I think, as I say, it was there was recognition that he was taken aback by, um, and lovely reaction from the other authors who were all you know very supportive. I, I had a chat with them all beforehand in the in the green room as Amazon plied them with alcohol prior to the uh, the event kicking off. Um, so yeah, generally it was just it was very it was a very good uh, event. Lots of people there. Um, some wanting to speak to me, which was very nice, um, and lots of them are coming next year to the, the live event, so it's going to be fun. Excellent. Well, there's one thing I think maybe slightly odd about the Kindle Storyteller Award. I should raise this with Darren, um, and I, maybe I've got this wrong, but I think it's only open to books that are published within a, a very sort of short period. I think it's May, June, July, and August. Um, no, I think it's... I think it's a year, um, but you you have to the metadata. Basically, you enter by changing one of the metadata fields with the words storyteller or, or something along those lines. I think it's longer than that actually. So you could enter next year probably. Well, who oh. knows if you uh, you got to get published. So <laughs> not, not maybe, maybe the twenty twenty one. Not far off now. Um, I know. I thought I read somewhere and it precluded me entering. For instance, not that I necessarily would. Although I don't see there's any harm in. I think most people probably have entered. I think Tom Ashford said that he'd changed his field to enter. But um, yeah, why mm. didn't you shortlist Tom? I don't choose the shortlist. There was um, there were five books that I had to read in about two weeks, which was challenging. Um, but um, Amazon choose. I I don't know. I know they have thousands of entries. I think it's yeah. it's. It, it, they have a system for whittling down the field to the the shortlist. Yeah, well, anyway, it was five outstanding finalists and a very worthy winner. So great and well done for your judging. Are you going to be asked back again, do you think? Well, I didn't disgrace myself, so um, who knows? We'll see. Did you stay up last night? (laughs) 
No, I didn't. It's, as it's Freya's birthday today, so oh, I had yeah. to um, I'd get her up this morning. She was awake at um, half past six, excited about her birthday. So, um, no, I was home. Good. Okay. Well, let's mention uh, Self Publishing 101, which is a course that set many of the people who uh, entered that competition and probably some of the finalists onto their route to commercial success, builds the foundation for turning your hobby into something that you can make money from. The, the course is very comprehensive, 20 odd hours uh, of instruction, and you can sign up for as little as $49. This is very commercial, but what, what the heck? Uh, $49 a month on a payment plan. Now, that's available for a few more days as I speak. In fact, it's going to close on Wednesday night. It will be a last chance to sign up until we open it again uh, in 2020. So you need to hop over to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash 101 if you want to jump onto that 101 bandwagon. Good. I think that's it. I think the next uh, episode, I'll probably have our next live training uh, sorted out. I think we'll probably do some Instagram. It seems to be the hot topic at the moment for uh, for authors. Um, and I've done two or three interviews on the subject now, and I'm still not as good as I should be at Instagram. So I think definitely we will get one of the Instagram experts, probably Stuart, along, and we'll do a proper deep dive into how to make Instagram work for you as an author um, and, and the nuts and bolts of the... Um, of the platform as well right mark are we ready for our interview oh yes let's let, let's do the interview let's do the interview so this is hillary jastra now hillary uh you will discover in this interview uh is a very positive person she has a very practical uh almost not procedural makes it sound a bit dry but she has a method for getting things done and moving on in life almost regardless of some of the obstacles and she's somebody who speaks from uh, a great experience in that sense that she had an extremely difficult start in her life and she's used everything that she's achieved and everything she's gone through to help other people with obstacles in front of them now that doesn't necessarily mean that you are uh, not able-bodied for instance but it, all of us one way or another probably have some obstacles in our life that we need to manage uh, and overcome if we're going to be as successful as we want to be so that's what Hillary talks about and she has good resources available to help you with that and organization so let's uh, let's hear from Hillary then Mark and I will be back for a quick chat off the back of the interview this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer so Hillary welcome to the self-publishing show Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here. All the way from uh, Minnesota. <laughs> and it looks, we, we are, we're British, so we always talk about the weather immediately. We meet anybody. <laughs> and uh, it looks lovely out there. Is it it's spring? lovely today. Yeah, it's getting around to spring. We call this fool's spring because okay. a bit early. typically we're, it's, a bit, it's a bit early. So we're, we're going to be battening down, I think, maybe one more time. But... Um, it's nice. I'm on the porch right now. I can't stay off of here when it's nice like this. I work out here. It's wonderful. Sounds perfect, Hillary. Ne'er cast the clout till May is out is the old English expression for not getting very excited nice. about an early spring. Yes, because, uh, very don't throw nice. do jumper off yet. Okay, look, let's talk. We're going to talk <laughs> uh, mainly, I think, about nonfiction writing, but there will be elements of this that apply to anybody who's basically a business, which is what a self-publishing author is. And uh, I know in our pre-discussion, we talked about repurposing existing content, which is a massively overlooked area by many people. They don't realize that they've got books in them and they've got courses in them just from the stuff they've already done. So we're going to come on to that uh, with some good examples. But why don't we start with a bit about who you are, Hillary? Why don't you give us the, uh, the skinny on who, on who Hillary is? Well, I became a writer at the age of four when I wrote I a book about, yes, about two potato chips getting married. And, a romance. Um, it was a romance. That's right. That's where, my, that's where my heart started. And, you know, I just kept writing. I kept gravitating towards writing. In um, sixth grade, I was part of an advice column for, you know, the kids could call in or they could send you a message anonymously. And uh, and so and then we would anonymously, I was part of a team, we would anonymously give or we would give our answers out. So it'd be something like, I like this boy and I'm not quite sure what it, and we would say, dear perplexed in whatever, you know, in classroom <laughs> in 4B, five. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so 
But it just kept going. I kept gravitating towards that, um, became a feature editor of the newspaper at high school. I went to advertising and marketing school. And it just, everything that I've done has been about writing. At this point, I've probably written, I don't know, 200, 300 blogs. I've edited thousands more because I'm an editor also at the Good Men Project. And just the sheer amount of content that I've gotten my hands on has really been the game changer for me. Um, from first starting out and then now, you know, I've done so much more. I also wrote a novel. It only took me eight years to write it. So, um, that, that, that sounds familiar to me. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So the name of it is Killing Carl. And it's written from the perspective of a serial killer's wife. So this is like way back before Mr. Brooks or whatever. And in fact, when Mr. Brooks came out, I took my manuscript, I threw it in the fireplace. Uh. So I... <laughs> I thought, I'm done, I'm done, Mr. Brooks came out. Um, <clears throat> but my point is that, and Killing Carl's with two Ks, by the way, but my point is that, um, you know, it's always been ingrained in me. It'd be far easier for me to stop living, to stop breathing, than it would be to stop writing or stop creating. And I have to be very selective about what I expose myself to, because then my mind starts to unspool and unravel all sorts of, you know, different opportunities. Uh, last year, I finished a book. It's a nonfiction. It's called Six Success, The Entrepreneur's Prescriptions for Turning Pain into Purpose and Profit. And that book is quasi-memoir of my life growing up in the various life because I had a very, very tough childhood. So I've taken those lessons and turned them around and I use them for empowerment now. And I'm trying to help other people find their own signature brand of empowerment so they can walk into the fear and come out stronger. Um, and the second half of the book is actionable content that readers can take in terms of what do I do if I'm making a decision I can't even get in touch with my gut, for example. There's a little trick you can do. It's about channeling your anxiety into productivity and things of that nature. So um, there's always a part of me that's writing. You yeah. can't shut it off. You know how that goes. There's, well, there's no choice. A, there's a theme there about about repurposing adversity, I guess, isn't it? And rechanneling that. But well, let's come on to that because I think it's a really interesting area. Um, but uh, tell me about the editing, first of all. So you have a, a sort of editing company, I guess? I do. I have a digital marketing company with an arm that is Bookmark, which is an editing house. So it's different from a publishing house. And I think this is a need that's very niche right now. So <clears throat> what we're seeing is that traditional publishing is changing. And uh, what that means is that it's not 1975. You can't pitch to Random House and expect to get through any type of meaningful layer so you can't get to a decision maker. You're going to have to first get a literary agent, but then you're going to have to pitch them with a query letter and you're going to have to make sure that's all, you know, formatted appropriately um, and written to be compelling, et cetera. Like there are actually formulas because I, I know this because I studied that when I was pitching my book. I actually flew to Hawaii to pitch it, Killing Carl. So um, it's very determined and that's another key component, very determined. But so anyways, they, you're not going to get that $275,000 advance from the publisher anymore. You're, they are built around large names that want, that are going to be able to carry their marketing, that where their the money that they put out is going to come back to them. It's going to, it's going to give them a return, a quantifiable return. And so many people are out there and they have a lot of information to share. They have They've been in business for a while. They're experts in their field, et cetera. And what happens is that they feel like that's the only way to go. Well, if I can't get into a traditional publisher, I'm not going to get the marketing. I'm not going to get the advance. I'm not going to be able to put my work out there. And that's simply not true anymore. Yeah. Because at Barnes & Noble is the last um, physical book chain in the U.S., and there were just rumblings that the person who owns 19% of that company will potentially be looking at selling it or, or doing something, something else with it. And so we're looking at yet another in the final large chain bookstore closing for a reason. 
I mean, it's like the Amazon, you know, makeover of the world. Everybody wants it now, quicker, smarter, faster, customized. And the same is true of publishing. So it's, it's quite simple. I mean, I'm not a publisher from the standpoint that I'm going to take cases of books and put them in my garage, and then I'm going to arrange your signing, and I'm going to do your PR and stuff like that. I'm not doing that. I'm not registering you with the Library of Congress. Simply getting you to a very well professional executed form and in nonfiction works, particularly in business, you're using that to leverage your existing media. So a lot of people say, well, I'm going to lose my shirt on this. Well, you're focusing on individual book sales and that is not where the focus needs to be. The focus needs to be on this is a piece of marketing that you're going to use to leverage and sell additional larger ticket, higher price tickets of marketing. Yeah. So that you are going to make your investment back in it. And there's a lot of people out there who are creating content every single day from podcasts, for example, from their blogs. Um, I helped a client complete a book that was done completely from a YouTube transcript of courses that he had made. So, so you, turn, it, you not, turned that into a book. Turn that into a book. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what turn we were allu- into a book. alluding to at the beginning. Mm-hmm. People don't necessarily realize not only do they have a book in them, they've already got a book out of them, but they just haven't turned it into a book. Um, <laughs> they have a book out of them, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's um, there's a couple of things I want to pick up on there. So I think I, I absolutely uh, agree, the whole kind of query letter thing, and it's just, for me, it's a, it's a almost slave-like relationship. It's like a begging letter, and the, the formatted... Uh, I was l- looking some stuff on Twitter the other day, a literary agent explaining what to say, what not to say in a query letter, and I thought, you have direct access to the world's biggest book markets now. You don't need to bow at the the feet of the traditional publishers anymore, beg them to gracefully take on your book at, by the way, 85% of the income at the cost you can you normally sign for them there's just no need for that anymore and that's an exciting liberating thing so i don't ever i'm coming to the end of my first book i'm not going to send a single query letter not interested i'm really not interested in playing that game i'm going straight to the direct market i'm going to work do everything i can to be as professional as possible about me being the publisher and i'm excited about that so that's my little hobby horse this weekend having read a few things on twitter should keep off twitter um and secondly <laughs> yeah so the idea of the book and this is this is crucial that i think a lot of people in the non-fiction world don't get right and a lot who are being successful do get right is understanding what you've just said about the book being at its simplest the lead generator and at its most complex a brand ambassador for you and everything else comes off the off the back of that right the online course is the place where there's money uh, to be made for you in your business so it's um it's an exciting area it's very exciting. And it's exciting because you give your authors permission to not look at individual book sales. So there, a lot of them come to me and they'll say, well, I'm, I'm concerned about this. How, how do I know it's going to sell? I want to tell you what, I had a royalty check come in the mail the other day and it was for $27. Okay. And that, <laughs> but that is not, that is not the point. That's just a little tiny stream of passive income. It's knowing how to leverage everything, but it's also knowing what's trending. It's also knowing what's available to you. Writing isn't even writing anymore, which we do serve writers who come to us and say, well, I have a first draft manuscript and we do everything from content editing, which is the full Monty, digging in um, from ghost writing all the way to proofing just for grammar, punctuation, et cetera. We really try to focus on those areas. Um, but it doesn't, a, a lot of times people come to me and say, I have an idea. I need to fully flesh this out. Great, we'll sit down and do an outline package and we bang it out in real time so that they understand they're taking from such diverse topics and they're putting them all into this blender and they have no idea what order they need to go and they have no idea of the structure and things of that nature. And that's actually fairly simple. So we sit them down, take them through the outline. When they're done, we send them off to do a dictation. So go ahead and do your dictation. This is what you're going to be talking about. You approach it like a speech. So if I'm giving a speech, I'm not boring you to death with PowerPoint, 15 points, whatever, but I am going to have three main points and under those I'll have three sub bullets potentially and I will speak it out. The biggest thing is to get out from behind your own self-doubt. So I also cultivate an environment of total, I have to do the namaste, Mm -hmm. total self-love and total self-acceptance because there's no such thing 
as writer's block. There's writer's judgment. That's it. That's it. And when you can exist in the same room with the judgment and say, I see you here, you're over there sitting in the corner. That's great, do your thing. I'm still going to take action. I'm going to focus on the action. I'm not going to focus on what's trying to hold me back here because that's, that's not a tool I need. It's not even a tool. That tool might come in handy if I'm running from a lion. But right now I don't need it. So I'm just going to sit it in the chair and say, that's fine. I acknowledge you and move forward. Your first draft is going to be crap. I'm going to tell you right now. It is. And anybody who says, you know, well, I don't, I don't need an editor. I'm going to, I'm going to do this myself or whatever. I highly encourage you to give yourself permission, and this is from Natalie Goldberg's book, this is the classic book, Writing Down the Bones, you are free to write the worst crap. And when you give yourself that permission, you're able to keep moving forward. Moving forward then allows you to say, I accomplished something and then you're building up your confidence. So we do a lot of mindset work too, in terms of get into the appropriate frame of mind to move forward, but also do it. It's such a weird balance of, I have the confidence to write a book, but I have to be coachable enough to intake information so that I can turn out my best iteration possible. Yeah, there's a, again, a couple of things I wanna pick up on there. Um, one of them is this this mental trick you talked about playing, about parking the fear, parking the self-doubt, uh, which I have to say is easier said than done. It is, um, but it's also conditioning. So um, This is something you can of, learn to do. Absolutely, absolutely. But you have to get very self-aware of it. You have to get very self-aware. That self-awareness is also a tricky balance, too, of saying, I acknowledge that I'm doing things that I'm not crazy about right now, but I acknowledge them in a way that is not threatening to my self-esteem. So I can say, I did this, I see it, but I'm not going to let that affect my self-esteem. So it, the same thing happens when you're writing a book. You have to be self-aware, but you also have to be self-loving enough to say, hey, I did that. Okay, not crazy about it. Let's move on. You're not going to flog yourself for it. You're not going to browbeat yourself for it because nothing is going to come out of that positive. So you're always moving forward in a positive way and you're rejecting anything that is negative on your journey. And that's where I come in. I've got, I've got authors that come to me and say, I can't get off this page. I can't get, and I said, because you're editing. When you're writing, write. Don't put on your editor hat. When you're writing, write. So that you're allowing whatever that process to look like, it, it comes out of you. And it looks different for everybody. Some people are like, well, I'm an outline person. Somebody else over here is I'm a mind map person. Um, I have one client that needs to take a break and do some graphic design around her, you know, around her inspiration. Some people use a vision board, etc. Whatever that looks like, you have to honor that process in you and not edit it. The time for editing will come. Trust me, the time will come. And the best way to get the best possible sparkliest version of your book out of you is through multiple rounds of editing, multiple rounds. The other thing that I try to do is look at each book as a product, because it is a product. What's your end game? And it is always, especially in terms of nonfiction, it's always going to be to make money. Every single business owner, every single entrepreneur is saying quantifiably, why does that make sense to do that? Why do I want to pay you this money when, when I'm thinking in my head I'm going to be in the hole? But if you think that way, then you're missing out on the opportunity. Let's say your book is $15.99, for example. Okay, you're not going to sit and tally up on the abacus. That's another $15.99. That's another. But you are going to say, I'm going to use this book to turn out my new speaking engagement where I'm talking about X and, you know, and that's a $2,000 webinar or whatever. So take a look at how you can quantify that, make your money back. So there's all kinds of mindset things that I don't think people are really prepared for. You need a guide on this yeah. journey 
That's why it took me eight years to write that first book. But I had to. I did hire an editor. I did get a literary agent. I flew to freaking Hawaii because, and I p- pitched everybody. I had people from, you know, Random House were there, Harper Collins. You know, I was hungry for information about how to do this. So now you can do it, but you have to pivot with the times too. And right now, it's the time to pivot. It's not the time to panic that traditional publishing is going away. It's the time to get excited because people who otherwise may not have a voice can have a voice now. Yeah, and that's absolutely something to celebrate. And I guess um, it stands to reason that this is more difficult at the beginning when you haven't had any, what you might use the posh word validation, but you haven't had any success uh, at this point when you're writing your first draft. Um, I think, and I see this in other writers, once they, they all say the second book is a lot easier and the third book, because by then they can brush off some of the self-doubt. They can, they can use a practical exercise of doing that by thinking, but actually I've been successful and I've had this, so I know I can do it. When you're doing your first draft, which is where I am, and quite a few people listen to this, it's a bit, little bit harder because there is this vague idea that it's all rubbish and it's all for nothing. Yes, there's that vague idea that wants to echo in your head and it wants to derail you. But you have to ask yourself, what is at stake? If I listen to that voice, what pain is greater for me? So when we want to change our behaviors, we're reluctant to do so because something is at stake. So what is at stake if you pull away from that idea that you aren't good enough? That means you're really in the game then. You have nowhere to run. You have to see yourself transparently. And that's very scary. I think that's very scary for many, many people. And that needs to come with it and have a huge healthy dose of inner core self-esteem. Because it's not about what you're putting out and how the readership is going to receive it. There is a component of that in business. But you have to write the book for you at the same time. So you're not writing the book it's there's such a weird there are multiple balance beams that you're straddling when you're right at first you're going here on the self-confidence beam then you're over here on the writing for me beam and then we're you know and write commit to it so fully 100 percent what you want to say write in terms of being persuasive but don't let that be the only lead for you Your goal is not to persuade, your goal is to serve. And if you keep coming back to that, what you're trying to do is provide value, you're never going to go wrong. Everything follows service, everything. The universe is built this way. And if we don't get the service back directly from it, then will somebody over here or some crazy wonky way will come over and be like, hey, blah 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 and i heard about this whatever and that is your fulfillment for the service that you give so if you focus on serving and you focus on making sure that your readers have the best of you you're not going to go wrong henry what sort of businesses are your clients running oh good grief that's a (laughs) i tell everybody like i do everything but agriculture and uh like farming i don't i don't want to do that um but the majority of them work in real estate they work in investing their uh international sales business coaches life coaches health coaches uh financial planners lawyers uh, doctors so i have a i run a gamut of people um and there's no they're all amazing there's no area there that isn't um affected by the kind of digital liberation the the digital transformation so even a doctor now you know with the online uh, doctor consultations and uh, there's a real thirst from the worried well of learning more about health from uh, from qualified people online and there's lots of uh, areas maybe maybe farming is the one you should avoid because i can't immediately think of <laughs> i suppose there must be some some uh, 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 some gurus online who can help your yield but anyway, let's uh, park that for one moment. Um, so that's in. So someone comes to you, and I'm interested that you were talking about earlier about uh, people coming to you with a fully formed book, but you almost seem to me to prefer it when they come to you and say, this is what I do, and I want to get to this point. And you can start with the raw materials at that point. 
Yes, because if you come to me with an outline, we're going to have to sit down and go through the outline. We're going to extract more and put that in the outline anyway. So I think it's absolutely fine to begin that way, uh, especially just from the standpoint of commitment. You're taking the time to sit down and write down the outline, and you're ensuring that you're doing the best of your, to the best of your ability with the tools that you have at that moment, and then you come prepared in that manner. But we're, I'm still going to tear it apart like a wolverine on an apple, man. I'm just going to, I don't know if they eat apples, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> but it we're still going to tear it apart. Yeah. They, right. Yeah. Carnivorous. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, let's talk about the, uh, the book itself then, that somebody who, who might be in the online space at the moment, they might be quite simply selling themselves as a consultant or uh, as a speaker, um, and they haven't really twigged this whole book thing. So what's the advantage of them having a book uh, for sale? Oh, it's fabulous. So you want to use a book funnel too, and which is what I'm, I'm telling all of my business people because the book funnel enables you to upsell your product, whatever that happens to be, whether it's a webinar, whether it's a personal coaching program, whether it's a seat, um, you know, when you're giving a speech somewhere, whatever the case is. But the other thing that's advantageous is you can negotiate with the venue or with your corporate sponsor. You always want to look for those uh, bulk sponsorship opportunities. So if you're going to speak somewhere, you can say, great, I'll, I'll speak somewhere and my fee is X, but I'm also requiring that you buy two cases of my books. So, and doing that feeds directly into your bestseller, Amazon bestseller algorithm as well. So it's strategic and it also gets uh, your information out to your audience a lot more readily. Yeah, and again, each one of those books that goes out is part of your lead generation. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's an interesting little tip by itself. So would you, when you do that type of deal with somebody, you're asking them to buy the book through Amazon or through an online retailer because you want, you want the sales there, don't you, for uh, visibility? Well, you're asking them to buy the book through Amazon, but they're going to bulk purchase it so then they can provide it to their audience. Okay. Right. So let's talk about um, uh, the, the mindset that we referred to earlier, kind of adversity and triumphing over that. And there's been quite a few stories, high profile stories in the press at the moment of um, people. I mean, I've been it's quite controversial, the, uh, the Neverland documentary, but I'm going to say having watched it, it's quite an affecting thing to watch, to hear grown men who have only recently went through horrific experiences as children and have spent 30 odd years not talking about it and lying about it and covering up for the person who did it. And have eventually, and that, that for me really shows you the, the, the day, you know, how a life can be completely transformed from a difficult start. And if there's, if there's a way of turning that, of, of somebody working with people who have been damaged at an early point, if I use the word damage, I don't know, and turning that into an ad advantage, I mean, that's just a glorious thing because it's, it's painful and horrible to see somebody have their lives taken away from them. So I'm guessing you've hinted at the beginning, you had your own struggles uh, when you were young. And this is a theme with you now, is, is, is not ignoring it, but turning that into something that drives you forward. Well, it is. My struggles came from poverty, repeated abandonment, um, and just a lot of instability. There's mental illness in my family, uh, abuse, and things that just really trying circumstances that leave you with nothing in terms of tools to get ahead in life. So you have to try and figure things out on your own and relationships and what does this look like and whatever. Um, but then... Five years ago, around April 1st, actually, the worst April Fool's Day joke ever, I got sick. And so I have a disease called transverse myelitis, which is multiple sclerosis's ugly, ugly sister. I have a lesion in my spine that interrupts electrical signals all day long. And I lost my job and I lost my health insurance. And the, in the first year of my business, I was on unemployment for nine months. And uh, so my body is very odd. So if we were to take a short walk, I could keep up with you. But if you wanted to keep going, um, if you wanted to go to a shopping mall, for example, 
probably after about an hour, I would not have the ability to even walk because my my body just shuts down and says, you know, the funniest thing, and, and I always look for, life is a combination of light and dark. It's never just dark. And we can find those lessons so deeply inside the tragedy. For me, it helps to say, what am I supposed to do with this? Not why me. Why me is based in ego. I look at things like, why not me? Look at, look at the odds of this. And take a look at our environment, take a look at our toxicity and all of these other things. So our fears and our tragedies are opportunities. We don't learn as much from these groundbreaking moments as we do from the moments that nearly threaten our lives or they shake up our value system and we have an opportunity to get stronger there. So I do pull some of that into my work with people and I think it's very helpful because I'm able to say I've been there. I know what that feels like. I spent a very long time being rageful. I was so angry and I thought, my God, I must have picked the shortest straw in the universe. And what did that do? It didn't serve me at all. I kept getting the same type of energy and vibration back. Relationships falling apart, whether, whether they were romantic or familial or friends or whatever. The self-doubt not allowing me to push myself further because I had no idea of healthy boundaries. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you have to forgive yourself for not knowing better. You, in a sense, are a toddler who has wandered out into the street. And we're not going to punish that toddler. We're going to say, oh, okay, you didn't know this. Now you know this, so don't do that because that can hurt you. And that is how you have to be with yourself. And it's interesting because I now almost look forward to mistakes, just the way that people purposely break things. Before they go to market, they'll say, okay, this is the process, this is a system, I'm gonna try and break this in every way possible and anticipate it. When you make a mistake or when you encounter something that is incredibly emotionally moving and it splits your life into before and after snapshots of yourself, before this happened, I was this person, after this happened, I was this person, that is incredibly invaluable information that you will not get at any other point. You, you couldn't even, you could say hypothetically, I think I will do this if this happens in my life, or I think this might happen if this happens in my life, but you really honestly don't know. And so when you come up against something that is invaluable information, you can use that information to move forward and handle things in a better way in your business, in your life, in your relationships, impossible. My, I'll give you an example of a relationship. So my husband and I, I have been married three times now. I've been with my husband now 10 years. We're coming up on 10 years in July. Prior to that, I was married twice before. I had no idea what I was doing. And, uh, <laughs> and so my current husband and I had to learn how to fight. We had to take a step back and say, we both don't know how to argue productively, okay? So you need to be heard, I need to be heard, but what's driving us right now is the fear that we won't be heard, which is influencing our behavior and causing the fight to go off the rails and to escalate and up the ante of pay attention to me, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. I'm, I'm going to do more and more and more until you pay attention to me. And that's damaging. What we literally had to do was use a talking stick. Oh, really? We had, we did. And that talking stick could be anything. It could be like a bottle of Windex. It could be the remote control. It'd be like, it, and you have to, this is all conditioning. Just as we talked about, it's all conditioning. Any thought that comes into your mind, the biggest and most powerful thing that you can ever do is pause the power of the pause to just say, it's okay that I don't know what to do right now. Or maybe even doing nothing is your choice if you don't know what to do. And so it's okay to step back and say, I don't know how to do this right now. 
I'm going to support myself as I go through it. I'm going to support my husband as I go through it. And as we learn how to argue, it was very funny because it would be like, you don't have the talking stick. Why are you, why are you talking to me? You know, and we would just start laughing. So you also have to invite that levity into your life. I think we're so damn serious all the time too. And we're just a bunch of bumblers on this planet. We're bumbling around. Half the time, people aren't doing things to offend you. They're doing things because just as you have limited tools at that time, so do they. And so we have to forgive them and say, I know you didn't know better. There are a very, since I got sick, I know there are way more good people than malicious people Mm -hmm. in the world. And so we have to give them that benefit of the doubt. You're not, okay, you're probably not a serial killer, so you didn't mean to do that. Great. Okay, fine. But you are a bumbling human who is just trying to get it right like the rest of us. And the internet has accentuated and amplified this, hasn't it? Where there was a little bit of dissent and occasionally somebody who might poke you. um, Suddenly, social media just puts all of that on tap and amplifies it. And it makes it even more important that we remember that most people are good (laughs) and uh, friendly. And uh, even if we don't always come across that way, I just want to step back a little bit. So I know that there'll be people listening to this, this podcast who have their own um, uh, backgrounds that they're recovering from and surviving from. And again, I, I, you know, the very powerful interviews in Leaving Neverland. um, And I think one of the guys speculated that there might be a point in the future where he would allow himself not to think that he was in part to blame for what happened. And that was a a terrifying thing to hear him say. Um, But I think it's early days for them. So is there somewhere they, you know, of? do you provide any resources somebody can take advantage of or that you recommend somewhere they go or some exercises people do? Well, I think what's really important to do is make sure that you find the right counselor for you Um, and understand when you're going to a counselor, you are going to be doing work. And if you are not ready to do the work, you are not going to receive the results. So I've been in counseling off and on for about three decades. I also had a virulent eating disorder that was so voracious, it was eating the muscles in my body. And I had that for probably a good two decades. And the way that I got away from that or in better control of it was because I I had to, I don't wanna say it's getting tired of your own crap. I think that you are getting tired of pain And so when you're tired of pain, it's making that commitment to say, I'm going to find the help. But it's also okay when you go to that therapist and say, I'm not gelling with this guy. I don't don't really feel like we have this relationship. You have to develop a relationship where you feel like what you're being told to do or, or what's being shared is valuable to you. Because even though you're, you're going there, it's kind of a husk of yourself. You're not, you're not fully yourself and you're in lots of doubt. So a lot of the times depression, for example, looks like I can't make a decision on something and, and we don't even know where to start. So how do I even know I'm going to choose a good counselor? So get in touch with your gut in terms of how do they make you feel? If you feel like, wow, they're really missing the ball. They're not hearing me. Being heard is very important. It's okay to say, I'm not feeling this. I need to move on. I need to find somebody and keep going until you're validated. Right then, you need that external validation. Somebody saying, you're not crazy. This is what happens. This is what your brain goes through. When you go through trauma, we now know that PTSD, for example, which could be a one-time event, somebody goes to a war and sees something traumatic versus complex PTSD, which is ongoing exposure to traumatic events need to be treated differently. Both of those things are, they create different types of reactions and responses and they groove new things in your brain. So the other thing is that you're not going to change like that. Don't expect 100%. Okay, I address this. Now it should be done. No. You know, maybe you nail it the first time because you've got such drive and you really want to get it right. Okay, this is fresh out of the gate. The second time, maybe you don't do it. Maybe you get it again on the third time. Changing your responses, taking that pause because you're ungrooving 
your condition responses in your brain. You're ungrooving those and that you have associated some value with that. So, for example, when I was rageful, what was the value I associated with that is that I had to defend myself and stand up for myself. And that was the only way that I would feel like I was worth something. So to pull away from that, I had to accept that my value lies in here and it's not predicated on someone else. But I had to regroove it over and over and over and over again. It is, it's conditioning, but it's lifestyle conditioning too. There's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to it. So I'm not a counselor. I, I don't know if I could be a counselor. I think I would just love everybody. It's the same reason I can't go to the NICU and sing to the babies because I would be like, well, who needs a home? You know? Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> you come back with them. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But I, I think there's a huge overlap between bettering yourself and, and I don't want to say bettering because there's nothing wrong with the version of you, but it's pushing yourself to know more. It's pushing yourself to see your purpose. Everybody thinks, well, you know, I probably don't have a purpose. I just have a nine to five job. I'm a mom. I'm a this, some of that. We are all here to help each other tell our stories and to find power from that. So I just encourage people to look a little bit more deeply and value themselves a little bit more. Yeah. And finally, the area that we are in, the creatives, I guess, is the overall term. I, I suspect does it's an environment that does lend itself to a few more headspace issues than other careers because you're quite introspective or you're quite vulnerable when you put you out there. And whilst, you know, being a cop is an incredibly difficult thing, being a teacher is an incredibly difficult thing, they're surrounded by procedures and policies. Their difficulties are quite, not quite the same as somebody who pours their heart out onto a bit of paper or a video or whatever and puts it out there in the public and then sits there fretting about it. If you've got a small area in your mind for anxiety, being a creative is going to bring that out, I think. Oh, it definitely is. And But you know what? This is the year of the flip side. This is the year of the silver lining. So you can look, for example, at people who say, well, I was diagnosed with ADHD. Great. Do you know what else that means? You have the ability to hyper-focus and be incredibly productive. So I think we always have to look at the flip sides of those things. So immensely creative, means that you're going to be flooded with ideas and you're tasked with picking them out and figuring out which ones are relevant, which ones make sense going forward. But you're, you're going to have to deal with it. There, there are just things that you, you have to deal with and you have to learn how. You have to develop a plan. When you have a plan, even as a creative, like we all cling to that structure. So if I have a plan and I can say, all right, I'm going to read this book. I'm reading Tony Robbins' book right now. It's his old one. Um, awaken the giant within and I'm telling you what half the time I'm reading it I'm writing down article ideas and whatever because it's it's tapping into different parts of my mind that haven't been illuminated yet so you just have to allow for your process and get conditioned into saying this is part of it. Yeah, anxiety all the time. Gripping anxiety, stiff as a board in bed, retching, shaking. What can I do to get present in my mind? So they say education is like the, the cure to fears, right? If you get educated about it. Well, the other thing is get curious about it. So instead of reacting and saying, oh, this is happening to me, I don't have any choice, you can get curious about it. What, to, what the heck do I need right now that my body is doing this and how can I give it to myself? Hilary, it's been really illuminating talking to you and I, I love your um, relentless optimism and positivity. That's a, a great takeaway for everyone here is to always to think about what are the advantages I've been handed as well as the, um, we are naturally gonna see the disadvantages, aren't we, I think, but they are there as well. And, uh, con you know, the, the way that you're dealing with your own, the own fate that's been handed to you is, uh, is it its own way inspiring. So we wish you luck with that. Thank you so much. Thank um, you so much. I, I want to put out there that I do have a nonprofit to help chronically ill and disabled non entrepreneurs. Um, and that in, in the U.S., 
six in 10 people are dealing with a chronic condition. And that includes mental illness, cancers, um, Lyme disease, MS, and things of that nature. But I want to put that out there because this is the place where you can go to receive help. And it's really interesting because everybody at some point in their life, if you're not there yet, you will be there. And I'm, I'm not trying to be the harbinger of doom. But look at your Facebook posts, for example. How many people are going through cancer? How many people just had an accident? How many people need accommodations? We have to change the way that we're working and the way that we're thinking about the working world. So I wanna make sure that in, that's inclusive of mental illness, doubting yourself, anxiety, depression, all of those things, that people have a place to go so that they can be accepted and they can learn to turn that outside validation into inside validation. So tell us so, about, just tell us where they can go for the not-for-profit. Well, you can find us on Facebook. There is a private group um, that is the most amazing, committed, engaged community of people you'll ever meet in your entire life. It's SickBiz, just like it sounds. And then you can also go to sickbiz.com. And I have a weekly podcast that comes out as well where I interview uh, very inspirational people and people in the trenches who are making it work every single day despite their challenges. Fantastic. Hilary, thank you so much indeed from sunny Minnesota for joining us today and um, yeah, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go, Mark. So good advice, good place to go. That Facebook group uh, mentioned in the interview uh, it might be something that, to one degree or another, we, as I say, we all have our obstacles in our life, right? And, uh, you know, um, not everyone is, it's not always visible to people, of course, uh, but really good advice from Hillary and uh, I think quite a motivating interview. My obstacle is John Dyer. <laughs> He's it's, my it's obstacle. Quite a big <laughs> obstacle as well. To get it's over. hard to get around. Yeah, he, yeah. he's pretty tough. <laughs> Poor old John. Um, yeah, we're, we, we, love, are, we love John. We love John. And um, most of this wouldn't happen without John, by the way. You wouldn't be listening to anything. Uh, and yeah, it's been, uh, it's been um, you know, a fairly intense time for us. We've traveled in September. We have our launch now. We're traveling again next month. Oh, yes, I should mention that. So in fact, next week, I'll have the details sorted out. We need to make a few decisions about what we're going to be doing in uh, Las Vegas for 20 books. We will do something uh, for our SPF community probably on the Wednesday night, but details next week on that. So uh, tune in, as they used to say. Uh, however, John Dyer and I, as always, will arrive a few days early and try our best to pick up some testimonial interviews. So if you've done the course, either course 101 or ads or even cover design, and you'd be happy to provide a cup of coffee or if it's after 12 o'clock midday a beer uh, for me and John and we'll turn up with our cameras we'll sit down we'll ask you a couple of questions about uh, what you thought about the courses and Mark Dawson's instructional technique uh, and we are going to be you know if you draw a triangle from Vegas Phoenix Tucson San Diego up to Los Angeles that area of southwest United States we have a car we can travel so just drop us an email support at selfpublishingformula.com and we'll come and see you uh, and we might we might host something informally, maybe in LA, somewhere people can get to. Not that you can get to anywhere in LA easily, but uh, it seems to be a big centre. Uh, possibly um, on maybe the Friday night, but uh, more details about that closer to the time. It's always nice meeting people in person. It was brilliant in Nink, and it's going to be amazing in 20 Books next month, Mark, because that is the biggest gathering of like-minded authors in the world. Yeah, no, it's going to be fun. I've, it's the first time I've been to that one. Um, I've got a so I'm going to Seattle on the Saturday. Um, so I have a day in Seattle on Sunday that I don't have anything to do. So maybe I should do something on um, on the Sunday. We'll think about that. But and then I'm going to Amazon on the Monday to go to the offices and meet some American Amazonians that I've been working with um, in advertising and again the KDP team. So that'd be fun. And then I'm jumping on a plane Monday night to come to Vegas, um, which I'm, I'm looking forward to. Just got to think about what I'm going to say. I'm doing a keynote speech. Wow. Um, and I'm still not quite sure what I'm going to do. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about either going to be something along the lines of the talk I gave at Nink, so kind of a philosophy of advertising, or it might be probably more likely to be something more motivational. Um, and I'm not really a motivational speaker. I'm not Tony Robbins or anyone like that. Um, so we'll see. I've got some ideas though. So, you know, I've got to start putting some slides together because 
in the meantime, I'm off to Disney. So there's there's a lot. Yes. I've got loads coming up. That is soon, isn't it? Now, what, a, what a fantastic eighth birthday for Freya mm. going off to Disneyland, Disney World. Yes, Disney World. Yeah, so really looking forward to that. But there's just tons and tons going on at the moment with um, yeah. trying to juggle everything. We're doing a webinar tonight as well. So as obviously as this goes out, it will have happened. Um, but that's, um, that's, that's to be done this evening too. So loads going on. And I have a long list of things to do, and including on that list is I don't think you've told me which flights you want from uh, Seattle down to Vegas. So oh, yes. Yeah, we need I'll to do, do that, that today. Yes. Uh, and we'll get that done. And, yeah, but it's always nice meeting people. And, of course, next year in March is going to be our very own event. It's going to be nine on a thousand, uh, as I say, like-minded indie authors all descending on London and then hopefully descending on the London Book Fair to give them a bit of a shock. Right. Yes, yeah, so I'm having some fun programming that now. So it's all um, mm. interesting stuff. So we've got a few people um, that are in the bag, so to speak. Two two speakers. We well, won't announce them yet. Um, but the, yeah, it's interesting because we've got to be out by four. So we've got nine till four with an hour for lunch. Um, so that's only what nine ten. That's three in the morning, maybe two in the afternoon. So five slots to fill. Um, so I'm actually wondering whether I I may or may not speak. We will have to see. I probably will. Um, well, you could do the. Um, we could we could introduce it, and you could do a sort of twenty minute rap at the end. Or well, you... I'm not, I'm not rapping. <laughs> I want to hear a that's, twenty that's minute non stop rap. That's not going to happen. I know. I was, I was there with Orna Ross last night, and she very very charmingly said that people would be disappointed if I didn't do anything. So um, I probably will do something. I just I don't quite know what I'll, I'll do yet. We'll see. We'll, we'll come up make, with something. Make sure John Dyer's got a good long slot. He needs about an hour and a half. To properly do his his bit so yes yeah absolutely no that's um we've probably we'll get a flood of refunds now now that you've mentioned that <laughs> good okay right i think that is it for this week thank you very much indeed marcus from salisbury thank you very much indeed for our patreon supporters and for you our dear listener thank you for joining us it is great fun we love doing this show and uh, we love being part of this community we are going to be back next friday information about our get together in vegas uh, and a few other bits and pieces so join us then and an interview of oh yeah good interview i won't preview it just yet just in case we change our mind the next week but a good interview next friday as well one for all of us that's it it just leaves me mark to say finally that it's a goodbye from him and a goodbye from me goodbye Goodbye. get show notes the podcast archive and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.